The Mats coasting on this Thursday. Hall of Famer Matt Miller. Good morning. And uh, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matthew Harvey. Good morning. Great to have you both here. And I understand that uh, in the comment section, there's uh, clamoring for a list of Italian restaurants that have my seal of approval. Yes, Matt, yes. They're not, not for me or Matt, yeah. but from the Godfather, the Podfather. The Podfather. <laughs> yeah. We're doing a podcast. So uh, you were, you're saying that uh, Fairmont, you call it Italian 79 as you're heading down that I-79 <laughs> yeah. corridor. There. Yeah, because the food is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's I mean, there's a large Italian population. Absolutely. And they're very... They're very proud of that, and they should be. And they do a, a great series of festivals. And man, you know, pe- the home of the pepperoni roll. I, I, I was just about to ask that. Awesome. Is this a controversial question? Is a pepperoni roll officially Italian cuisine, or it's officially West Virginia Italian cuisine? Uh, yeah. If you serve it at what? an Italian restaurant, it's Italian cuisine. It's as okay. simple as that. I, I just. Right yeah, now, uh, I'm not a. I've had pepperoni rolls. I, I admit I don't get the fuss over them, but I know a lot of people go crazy <laughs> over them. I'm not surprised, being from Maryland, that you don't understand. I'm not from Maryland. I'm from Pittsburgh. <laughs> That's a point. You just made my point again. You know, you do. Well, pepperoni. you're a Pittsburgh expat. My gra- Maryland. my grandmother is an off the boat Sicilian. She came here when she was 24. So. The cuisine end of things is not in question. I'm off the tree stand, West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do pierogies as a Pittsburgher? Uh, my mother made pierogies, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Hornby joins us by telephone. Good morning, Mr. Hornby. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, the Mats. <laughs> or m M&M. You can call us m M&M. <laughs> M&M. M&M, okay. Guess who's back? Back again, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hornby, yeah. Hey, uh, we, we didn't get a chance to get into some stuff last time you were here about some bills specifically affecting Berkeley County, so let's focus on that uh, in your appearance here today, sir. Yeah, we do have uh, a number of bills. I think uh, we've got an impact fee bill um, removing the word um, zoning from impact fees, um, which I think was important to Berkeley County. I know there is a bill going around the building that is uh, a sales tax um, um, bill. Um, I haven't, I, I've read it, but I'm not on it. Um, I don't know how far it'll go. Um, and then the, specifically, I do have a bill that was brought to me uh, dealing with Insorga, trying to let Apple Valley Waste uh, use that as a transfer station. So I think that's a good one. Um, that that'll be coming. So, Mike, do do we know exactly what happened with Ensorga yet? Has anybody investigated that? Well, from my understanding, it's the recycling, um, the cost to recycle. And, and, and during COVID, their largest client stopped using them so much that so they just didn't have the funds. They couldn't do the recycling. So, uh, it basically went under. Uh, and I believe Apple Valley is, and obviously Clint Hogman knows a lot more about this than I do, but I believe Apple Valley is trying to revitalize that within the next few years. And the first step is to allow them to use that as a transfer station. And Apple Valley put a lot of money and really helped Berkeley County out by cleaning up what was in Ensorga. Um, so, um, I, I think it's worth letting them have the shot at trying to revitalize that, that $20 million project. Mm-hmm. Oh, Is there any okay. way that they could adopt or recreate the technology that Insorga had to potentially make this fuel for other industries? Well, I believe that's, I believe that's the intent down the road, but uh, you know, until, until you can find a client that can purchase this fuel on a consistent level, um, you've got to do this in baby steps, and this is just the first step is just allowing them to use it as a transfer station yeah. to start with. I guess that's better than setting empty. Mm-hmm. It's better than a $20 million building setting do empty, you, yes. Do you think that that, that that road could handle the traffic as a transfer station? Um, I, I, you know, I can't really speak to that. I know it was handling it when, uh, when they were doing all the recycling. So, yeah. um, you know, if, for, for me it was like, listen, we – we invested in this already. Let's not waste this building. Does the state own that or the county? How did that work uh, yeah. with Enzorga? I think it's still owned by a private company, but I believe um, Apple Valley is you know, in the process or somewhere along. I don't know too much of the details of that project. I just know that we need to get this bill passed in order to, them, to get them moving in the right direction. 
What is the specific law that requires uh, legislative action as opposed to if that uh, so property is owned by private business? What? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is amend the definition of commercial solid waste facility. That's kind of what we're doing. Um, so right now, it's just the way that the, the definition in code is prevents them from doing what they're, they're doing. Okay. And again, it'd be a great conversation for uh, Clint Hogbin or somebody that knows a lot more about it. All right. Mr. Hornby sits on the Agricultural Natural Resources Committee, Banking and Insurance, Economic Development and Tourism, and uh, Education uh, as well here. Uh, Mike, speaking of agriculture and natural resources, uh, let's get back to, um, it's not a bill yet that I understand it, uh, it may never become one, but in regards to farmland protection and taking property that uh, people want to keep in farmland protection for a lifetime, maybe longer in perpetuity, and instead uh, perhaps cutting that off at around 25 years for further review? Um, I think there's something coming out of the Senate. I haven't read any specific bill yet. I think um, it might be coming out of GovOrg. Um, at this stage, I'm totally opposed, um, and I know the, the members of the, the House that I I with you know, deal with and the ag folks are definitely opposed but again we haven't read the actual bill i haven't seen it yet so i don't know what the proposals are why would you be opposed mike um well we live in the eastern panhandle and unless we're going to be uh richmond uh we're going to lose all our orchards farms uh with the development that's going on in the ep um you know e- we need to protect our farms, and, and we saw during COVID um, the shortages, the, the things like that. Without farmers, we won't have any food, um, and I think we need to protect our food in the future. Um, and, and this is a completely volunteer program. If you want to do it for your farm, you can. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's a great program, and uh, you know I, I do think there should be. You know, the Economic Development Authority could sit on the farm or does sit on the Farmland Protection Board. There could be some chances for a future um, where they could say, hey, you know what, this is not a this, – this piece of property is not a good idea to put into farmland protection because, you know, it's right next to Procter & Gamble and we need, we need to put a gas line in or electric or water or sewer. So there can be those conversations before it's put in. Um, and I think there should be some authority for, you know, the, the county or or uh, the economic development authority to have a say. Uh, I have no problem with wording like that for future stuff. Um, but when it comes to changing farmland protection, I, I, it, it's for me, it's a hard no. Does eminent domain trump farmland protection? That is a good question. I don't know. I, I, I presume... Yeah that imminent than they would, would. Yeah, that would be my instinct that it would trump it. Because. I mean, because, you know, that that would come in. They'll, the, and they'll use it for more for an easement, putting a gas line through, yeah. putting electric lines across. I mean, there's plenty of farms out there that have electric lines running right right along them, you know, or, or right through them. So um, I think that's something that is already happening. Is the idea of a review after you said it, it looked like 25 years, the concept that maybe I and my wife were farmers, we're not, actually we do have a couple pigs, but um, you know, we, we, we're not farmers, but, but if we were and we, we wanted to protect our land, we put it under farmland protection, but now 50 years later, two generations mm-hmm. of our kids are going, look, we were never farmers, we're not farmers, they left us this property, we really want to do something with it. Is that the idea? It, well, I guess that's the idea. The problem with that is you're paid up front um, your your value of your, of your developed land. So, you know, in other words, if you're you get let's just use easy numbers, you get a hundred thousand dollars today to put it in farmland protection. You use that, you're doing it. It, it decreases the value of your your land because mm-hmm. nobody can develop it. But the idea is a farmer can buy that land now as a farm and continue to farm. So even if your kids don't want to farm, um, they could sell it as a farm at farmland uh, value. Uh, and I know that's less, but the family has been paid up front for that property. 
if that makes any sense. Right. So the opportunity is still there. My kids say, they can look. still sell it. Right. Generally, when you buy farmland protected uh, property, it is much, much, especially in the Eastern Panel, it's much, much cheaper. Um, I know there's, you know, you can fifty thousand dollars an acre sometimes in, in the Eastern Panel, but with, with a farmland protection easement on there. It's usually you know on a three to seven kind of range per per acre, so it's much more affordable to actually buy a farmland protected piece of property so that you can farm. It's to encourage farming. Mike, I want to ask you about a school bill that you have allowing retired school employees to work after one hundred and forty days in certain circumstances. Can you tell me why yes. this bill is necessary? So we have a lot of retired uh, teachers that can you know work one hundred and forty days. Um, well, the school year is 180 days. Um, so at 140, we suddenly have a shortage. We have a critical need uh, in bus uh, drivers, so they can work over 140 days in certain circumstances, certain school personnel. Um, it just makes sense to me. Now, I've been told it will cripple the pension plan, but my bill has specifics in there saying they can't pay any more into the pension and they can't take any more out. Um, there are some IRS implications or Social Security. So if you're on Social Security, you can't really work more than 140 days. So there are some other things at at play here, but it was one of the biggest acts of our local BOE. So I created the bill, and I also have another bill that allows um, – Tier two teachers and personnel to bank their sick and personal days. Right now, they either use them or they lose them, uh, which encourages teachers to come out of the classroom, and now we have to put subs in there. Um, if you're not going to pay somebody, teachers are going to take those days off. I can't blame them. So I, I do have another bill that would allow them to do that. I think that's... Um, coming up here soon. Seems like these bills need to get passed together, Mike, because one influences the other. If, if I've got a 140-day cutoff limit and I can't make up the gap with teachers taking their sick leave, now I've got a double shortage going on. Well, we could roll them together. We talked about that in Education Committee. Um, it's far easier to run them separately because they're, they're, they're kind of separate issues and they, and they affect different things. The personal and sick um, bill, we've got there's like four or five of them going, going around. Some deal with um, that they get to use it in retirement. They get to do it. My bill was just a super simple, hey, you get to roll them over if you want and bank them. And, you know, so um, there are multiple faceted angles coming at this, and many people working on it. Is that something that teachers and bus drivers and, and other personnel like that at one time were able to do, correct? And then that and got stopped? Yes. So the Tier 1, they, they got all grandfathered in. And then we, when we changed, uh, when they changed it uh, a few years ago, 16, I think, um, all new teachers weren't allowed to. So I think this is a doable thing. It was something that we can we can fix and, and encourage our retention, encourage promotion of teaching. Is that something they would then get grandfathered back into, if you will, or that they would not get any sort of a back pay or for days that they well, lost? Yeah, I, I think that's too difficult. Okay. It would have to be moving forward. Matt Harvey. Is, are the unions in support of, of banking those days, or...? Yeah, I've spoken to Dale, and he, he's definitely uh, in support of that. Um, you know, he wants to take it further and make sure they can put it into their retirement at the end. It, it, it's, it's not a simple um, fix. So, you know, there's lots of asks. But, yeah, the unions are definitely, um, and the teachers are definitely for it, too. So Je Berkeley County has been pretty clear that they, that they desire to at least allow the voters to choose whether home rule is initiated. Uh, any 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 movement on a bill down there that would allow that, or, or is it a non-starter? Um, I know there is a bill, and I know this is going to be a very unpopular answer, but I don't. I think it's dead in the water. That's just my personal opinion, um, based on the conversations I've had um, with my fellow members. Is that because other counties don't have any interest in that, or it's just it allows yeah. the the it allows the local uh, commissions to institute a tax. Yeah, that's exactly what I think the latter is, is, is what. And when we, we, I sat in finance yesterday and we found, you know, really, we could use our excess levy to 
fun locality pay, too. Mm-hmm. But we haven't. Dale Lee says if we increased local share, you could fund it that way as well. Yeah. Right? That is true. Yes. So I, I don't know what it would take to increase that, but if we can't get it one way, maybe you get it another way. Is the, well, lack the, local, sh- the local share is our access levy. But that ha- that's a decision made by the school board and the superintendent, That is correct? exactly correct. Yeah, but, but when you have a local levy, you also lose some of the state funding because of the local levy, correct? You lose some of the state funding when you have an excess levy, yes. So if, if you increase the excess levy you to try to get locality pay, you have to make it up even more because you're going to lose some state share as well, right? That is correct. <laughs> So it's, it's a rigged game, man. Mm-hmm. It is. So that's my, my other bill, which um, passed through education and is sitting in uh, at leadership and waiting to come to the floor, is a complete study of the school aid formula to start from scratch. Because we've kind of amended and changed and added over the years, and it's so archaic. And um, so we're going to have a study resolution um, put together, and the powers that be will come up with a much more uh, modernized school aid formula that, that fits everybody's needs. Mike, this, is this library bill in front of education? Have, have you had to input? Uh, no, input? I haven't seen it. Um, I, I sat in the public hearing. Yeah. Um, what did you it think? Was, it was eye-opening, Rob. Um, the first few ladies that came up um, were reading some novels or from books, um, children's books, not not literature like you know the Scarlet Letter or something like that, um, but children's books and, and graphic comics. Um, quite frankly, I can't even say what they said in the public hearing over the radio. Um, it was very pornographic, and, and I was completely shocked. Um, and they had it right there in the public hearing time and time again. Um, coming up, and, and you know, I can see why there's a concern. I, I, I completely understand the uh, the intent of the bill based on the public hearing that, that I was at yesterday. Now, is this based on public libraries or libraries based in I, schools? I think it's the, well. I think it's actually it removes the. Um, it's more about the law that they can't hide behind the fact that they're a library or they're a school, and, and, and they they they're not allowed to you know, be sued or, or, or have any criminal process by sharing pornographic images to children. Um, well, like, if, let's take about, let's talk the Martinsburg Public Library. Would this bill affect them? Or are we talking more I like the Musselman would. Library? I, I, I believe it would. As, as I said, I haven't seen this bill come through education at all. I think gotcha. it's more up in judiciary. Uh, I think it's a judicial thing um, because it's more about the law. Um, I think it's a branded steel bill, if I'm, it if is. I'm correct. Yes. Um, and but based on the language that I saw, it was more about the law and you know taking away the. Um, it's not about specific. It, it's about pornogra- pornography being presented to minors so, or available to minors. And I didn't watch the public hearing, um, but one of the the first things that comes to my mind um, is what what about internet in public libraries? Is that addressed by this bill, or is that? No, I don't think so. That's uh, I mean, that's I the Gina filthiest Chia, place. Gina Chia in really the world. has uh, an internet uh, bill about pornography, making making sure that you put a driver's license number in. Because you would have, if you were a librarian, you'd have to shut mm-hmm. the internet off completely, or have well, some sort no, of you, filter. You could, no, you you can put parameters in for age restrictions on any computer. So they they could they could shut out any age inappropriate stuff on on a computer or on a browser that is does that does that also control the the traffic through their phone the internet traffic through their phone if they flip on a vpn and then connect to the wi-fi and there's and there's a 12 year uh 13 14 year old boy sitting in there and he and he downloads he gets on an inappropriate website um i guess is is that is that problematic under this bill I, again, I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. I just. I just went to the public hearing. Yeah. Um. And you know, I, when the bill comes to the floor, it comes to my committee. I will delve into it. I don't read every bill out there because 
I can only affect the bills I vote on. So uh, every bill that comes to the floor, I've read. Every bill that uh, comes from my committee, I've read and talked about and gone through. But that one is not one that has, has come across my desk. I just went to the public hearing to hear what everybody had to say. Mike, a couple of minutes left. Uh, the floor yeah. is yours, sir. What is important to you that we haven't discussed? Um, you know, I do have a raw milk bill that's coming up um, next week. That'll be great. Um, I have a home-based business uh, entrepreneur bill that's um, coming through. And then I've got my WVSSAC um, yes. bill coming through, too, which um, I think I've got a lot of support on. And then the Economic Development Authority um, Committee is um, going to be running my small business uh, tax credit bill. So I've got a number of things that um, I'm working on. Uh, we got our, fir- our first Delta House bill um, sent down to bill writing. That'll be very interesting. I think that'll make what the What does that in- increase the noise ordinance? Make the decimals? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a... It was a late night. We came up with an idea, and the four of us decided we would uh, put a bill together. We think it'll be great for West Virginia. What, can you can you give us? I mean, that's a good teaser, but can you give us a little more right now? So, so we're going to try and move the presidential election to the third week of February. That was the idea that we came up with. We looked at New Hampshire, we looked at Iowa, and we looked at all the economic impact that these counties are getting or these states are getting. And we thought it'd be a great idea to put West Virginia back in the in the relevancy thing when it comes to presidents. I agree. That'd be awesome. I love it. So um, it wouldn't move any of the other elections, but it would move our presidential election, our primary. Hey, the SSAC bill. What do you yes. think? What do you think? What are the chances of it getting through this year? I think I'm going to get it through education. We're going to go from there. Um, uh, you know, it's it's just putting them under rules so that they have to report their rules to the legislature, like every other um, thing does. I know they're technically not supposed to be a government organization, but they sure do affect our public uh, uh, our public schools, and those are funded by the taxpayer. Michael, thank you very much. Appreciate your time this morning. I appreciate your time, guys. I'm going to send you out with the Animal House theme. It opens up the movie here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget your pledge pin. That's right. <laughs> Talk to you next week. See you, buddy. Bye.